Alexander Ender on IKTV. I'm Tony Registered and I'm chatting with Professor Hilary Beckles. He is the author of his, well, the latest piece of his work is this book, Britain's Black Debt. Professor Beckles, of course we've got the Church of England in this whole affair. And um, what was their involvement, really? Because, you know, today we, 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 we know of Christianity to be um, what a religion of peace and fairness and that sort of thing. And of course, we have inherited the colonial church. Mm -hmm. um, so so wh where were they standing in, in all of this? Yeah. Well, recognizing that the established church, in this case we are speaking of the, the British Church of England, mm -hmm. it was a moral and religious institution on the one hand but it was also a business enterprise on the other hand because they need to generate revenue to maintain their churches, to maintain their cathedrals, to expand their parish churches, and to spread their religion through the towns and villages of the nation, which is a major capital investment that is required. And at the same time, the, the leading officials of the church, they are members of the property classes of Britain. Uh, most of the persons who ran the church were distinguished members of the aristocracy, the middle classes, and so on, who lived in privileged positions. And so the church bought into the slavery agenda for the simple reason that it was the biggest business in town. There was, it was, the, it was the, f the quickest and most reliable way to make a large fortune. Mm -hmm. If you were a, a businessman in 18th century Britain, you could invest your money in agriculture, you get maybe two or three percent return. You could invest in government bonds, you maybe get two or three percent return. You could invest your money in some mining in enterprises, and maybe get you know two or three. So you had options. But you can choose to invest in the slave trade, mm -hmm. or you can choose to invest in slavery, and you could make 20, 30, 40, 100 percent. It's a high rate of return. Uh, phenomenal. Mm -hmm. so, so the slave trade and slavery were opportunities to make what you call a massive killing, despite the risks in short time. If you were lucky or good at mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. you can make a phenomenal fortune at a rate that no other e economic activity allowed you to do so. Right. So the church, therefore, got involved as the owner of slaves, the owner of plantations. The, the priests themselves became very important slave traders and slave owners. The church played a role to help to justify the evil of the slavery and the slave trade. So once the church had provided the political coverage for it, there's, there's nothing wrong with it. So they gave this. them the moral stamp of approval. Yes, they gave basically. them, the, uh, you know, uh, you find rationales. Well, yes. you know that this is ordained by God and so on. And you provide the moral argument for the investment. Mm -hmm. but, and then they in turn made the investment as individual priests as well as the church as a system. So uh, right across the Caribbean, priests were among some of the richest slave traders and slave owners. Yes. And the Church of England itself owned plantations and did very well. A lot of the parish churches you see in England today, if you drive around England in the rural communities and you see in every little village, it's a beautiful parish church. Most of those were funded from the profits that were yes. brought out of the Caribbean to give the church the capital to make these investments. But, but, I mean, let's even take the reference of the Caribbean. You look at the Anglican churches. If you drive through the Caribbean islands and you see where the Anglican churches and the property stands, it's on some of the best pieces of land. Yes. <laughs> is, is that the same sort of history? Well, it's, it's linked with that mm. because um, the colonial government placed the established church in a very privileged position. But uh, in, in Barbados, for example, the island that I am, I am born on. At the height of slavery in Barbados in the 1780s, the largest slave owner in Barbados was priests. Mm -hmm. the, the Reverend John Brathwaite, Reverend of the St. John's Parish Church, was the largest owner of slaves on the island. Yes. And there were many others like him. Uh, in fact, one of, the, one of the greatest speeches made in the Caribbean uh, in the 1820s was made by Sarah Ann Gill, uh, a mixed race colored woman in Barbados, who argued in 1824 in a sermon, she gave a sermon on the platform of the Methodist Church. 
that you cannot be a Christian and be a slave owner. Now, it's I a want you, it's a contradiction. I, I want you to imagine an island yeah. or the Caribbean world in which priests are the largest, some of the yeah. largest slave owners. And someone says, you cannot be a Christian and be an owner of slaves. Well, they burnt down her church and drove her out of the island. Yeah. Now, because she got to the heart of the matter, because Christianity and slavery became so deeply entwined that they could not untangle themselves. Now, that is the legacy that the Church of England has had to deal with uh, across the Caribbean. I know that the Church of England has issued a formal apology for the owning of slaves, for the justification of slavery, mm -hmm. and for the ownership of plantation systems. They have offered a formal apology to the African people and their descendants, and that is fine. The next step, I believe, that the Church of England has to take now is to, is to return to the Caribbean in a formal way and participate now in the process of repairing right. some of that damage. Which is, which is what the reparation process and is. And in this case, it might just be it might just be the, the role for the church. It might just be to help with the psychological healing. Mm. The psychological healing of many black people believing that they are inferior, of many people believing that their skin, their beautiful black skin, is some kind of problem or curse that, well, they, features. that they have yeah. insisted it was during the slavery period, that somehow they were the descendants of Cain and God had ordained this. Many black people still are the victims of those ideologies. Maybe they need to return to the Caribbean now and practice a theology in the communities with uh, community centers, to help the NGO movements, help with cultural and artistic upliftment, to help people to purge themselves of that legacy that yeah. they have left behind. Maybe that is a role that they have to play in repairing the damage that they have done. Right. So in moving on, um, we, 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 we look at um, Dr. Eric Williams' work, um, Capitalism to Slavery, where he says here that the, the slave trade was the hub of the British Empire, right? The participants, the companies, the church, um, the government, the direct beneficiaries of what took place in the slave trade. Now, can you identify for me what exists today that can be directly linked to, you know, profitable companies that exist today that can be directly linked to the slave trade 300, 400 years ago? It's, it's, a, it's a very, very simple matter mm. to show the continuity uh, between the commercial enterprises, the, the elite families, as you say, the churches, the major institutions, including the royal family. Mm. All of these institutions and, and structures that we have today, most of them have their roots right there in the wealth of the system. If you take, if you start from the top, the royal family. Mm. The royal family was the first family to establish a large-scale slave trade company. Uh, King James II established the Royal African Company. This was this was given a monopoly by the royal family. Yeah. No other family or institution was given access. So for 30, 40 years, they had a monopoly of, of slave trading. The monopoly gave them the rights to export 4,000 Africans to the Caribbean on an annual basis, and they made a lot of money. If you look at the investors in that company, it's the royal family and their aristocratic cousins who were the stock owners. Uh, the king himself was the chairman of the board of directors. The company made a lot of money, and that wealth was spread to the royal family. That continued right into the heart of slavery in the 18th century. So at the front of this is the royal family. Then you go now to the aristocratic classes. Mm -hmm. These were the families who owned the slave systems in the Caribbean. If you take the British House of Lords today and look at the families in the House of Lords, if you look at the families that constitutes the British aristocracy today, the vast majority They're of them were our families whose elite status today was, was created slave. by yeah. and sustained by the slavery and the slave trade right into the present time. Then you go to the Prime Minister. If you take the Prime Minister, David Cameron. Mm -hmm. David Cameron's ancestors, the Earl of Fife, 
were major slave owners in Jamaica. So here is the British Prime Minister whose family roots are in the slave owner system, and he would have benefited and inherited the status, the education, the wealth, the property. So the royal family, the political elites, all the way down. Then you take the banks in the high streets. The Royal Bank of Scotland, mm -hmm. major investor in Caribbean slavery. Lloyds of London, the right. largest insurance company. Lloyds of London made its fortune from insuring the slave ships. Right. Because the slave ships were coming across the Atlantic. You have hurricanes, you have pirates on the high seas. The slave traders wanted their cargo, who were the Africans, well, the insured. Yes. Lloyds of London made its fortune out of insuring the cargo and the ships. Barclays Bank started out as a financier of the slave trade and slavery. Lloyds of London, uh, Lloyds Bank, mm -hmm. it's the antecedent banks of Lloyds and the antecedent institutions of National Westminster Bank and the Midland Bank. Midland Bank yes. The antecedent companies were all invested in slavery. So these companies, as you know them today on the high street, these are the rebranded names. These are the the, the re-engineered, rebranded institutions of the slavery ancestors that have come into the present. So you walk down the high streets in Britain today, you see Lloyds of London, you see Barclays, Barclays Bank, you Bank, see National see Westminster, you Midland see the Bank, Bank of Scotland, you see the Midland Bank. And these banks are all buried deep into the economic to the slavery system. Most of them have recognized this. Some of them have put it on their website. We recognize that we were, through our antecedent institutions, we were investors in slavery and we financed the slavery system, and some of them have recognized it. But that is not enough. The American banks have gone a step further. Most mm -hmm. of the American banks have said, yes, we were using slaves as mortgages, we were invested in them, and here is the evidence now. We are prepared to offer scholarships to the black community we are over to finance black institutions. So they're doing, they're, they're repairing. The American mm. institutions are struggling to repair. Right. Lehman Brothers recently began the process of repairing. The British financial institutions, the banks and the insurance companies, have not yet started a process following the Americans of repairing the damage they have done and recognizing that they have a duty to do so. So from that point of view, the Caribbean-British dialogue is behind the curve. Mm -hmm. The American dialogue is ahead of the curve. The Caribbean dialogue is behind the curve. So basically in the Caribbean, what we are trying to do is to say, let us bring this global conversation up to a level field where across the world, all of the victims and all of the beneficiaries are having the same conversation. Right. So we were like Barclays. We were like NatWest, Midland Bank, Lloyds of London, Royal Bank of Scotland, right. to have the same reaction as the American banking system, which is to say we need to go back to the Caribbean and facilitate the process of and development. And do some repairing. Now, again, we're at the end of the, the third segment. And the last and final segment, Professor Beckles, I'd like us to, to look at where the Caribbean reparation movement is at. And um, I know you were part of a delegation that went to the Durban conference in 2001, I think it was. So we'll pick it up on that um, tone of conversation when we okay. come back. You're looking at Unrendered on IKTV. My guest is Professor Hilary Beckles. We'll be into our final segment when we come back. <laughs>